please welcome the author of the New York Times bestseller, Contagious, Why Things Catch On, Jonah Berger. Good morning. So the theme of this conference is to make everyone a messenger. And that's an important job, and each of you has that role of being a messenger. But one of the questions I think we all have as a messenger is, well, what message should we be sharing? When we decide to pass on a message, how do we know which one to pick? Which one is going to be more effective? And not only will we share that message, but how do we craft messages that the people we share them to will continue sharing them? And to help us begin to think about that idea, I want to start in a very different place with a very simple game called Which is Tastier? Probably never played this game before, but you'll get the hang of it very quickly. So I'm going to put two things up on the screen, uh, and I'm going to ask you very simply which of the two is tastier. And I want you to be honest. Not which one you wish was tastier, not which one you think should be tastier, but which one of the two is actually tastier. And you'll get the hang of it very quickly. Our first contestant uh, is a delicious head of broccoli. Uh, now you probably know that broccoli has lots of vitamins and nutrients. You probably know that broccoli has lots of fiber. It's one of those great green vegetables. You probably did not know it has a lot of vitamin C. I learned that recently uh, through Wikipedia. But that's our first contestant, wonderful, delicious broccoli. And our second contestant is a cheeseburger. <laughs> now, this is not my version of a cheeseburger. Um, if I was going to eat a cheeseburger, I'd pick this off the web. It would have bacon on top of it. Uh, it would have blue cheese. It would have grilled onions. Somehow everything is better with bacon. Uh, feel free to pick your toppings for the cheeseburger. And to keep things even, to be fair, feel free to pick your toppings for the broccoli as well. Keep everything even. So which is tastier? How many of you would vote for the cheeseburger? OK, almost everybody it looks like. All right, uh, I'm not going to tally everybody up. It looks like about 95% of the room. Uh, and how many would go with the broccoli? OK, maybe 5 10%, something like that. Uh, good, now we know which of our colleagues, maybe you're vegetarians uh, or, or liars maybe, one or the other. <laughs> Um, uh, I'll let you look around the table based on how well you know them. You can probably guess. Uh, but the point here is really simple. We know we should eat more broccoli. Everybody knows that. right? We know that broccoli is good for us. We know it's the right thing to do. But unfortunately, people don't always do what they should do. right? When it's late at night, when we're tired, the cheeseburger calls. It's tastier than the broccoli. right? And that's not random or luck or chance why it's tastier. It's built in a certain way, designed in a way that fits with the way our stomachs and our tongues are designed. McDonald's has spent millions of dollars engineering french fries to have the right a bit crisp and salt and sugar so when you hit your tongue, your tongue lights up. Some food is tastier than others. And at this point you're probably wondering, is he going to talk to us for 50 minutes about food? I thought we were going to hear about messages. But I'm going to use this idea, this analogy of some things tastier than others, and port it to a different domain. And that is to ask the same question about our messages. How tasty are our messages? How tasty are our communications to other people? Not how tasty should they be, not how right is the message, not how accurate or correct is it, but how like is it to resonate with the people that we hope it will resonate with? Because as message builders, people often say, well, this is the right, correct information. People should do this. But just like with the broccoli and the cheeseburger, people don't always do what they should do. To make messages effective, we have to design them so they fit with the way that people are built. It's not the way their stomachs or their tongues are built, but the way their minds are built. Understanding why people talk about, share, and remember things. To use an example from a completely different domain, I've done some work um, with aviation. Uh, I was speaking at a big conference a couple years ago, and NASA has this great message about budget cuts. Right? Cuts to NASA's budget are really problematic. Delays in key programs, uh, along with our audience and Russian manned space vehicles, threaten our leadership in space. That's the important good message that they want to get out there. That's true. That is the right message. But there's another message out there. We've been to the moon. What else do we need? Now, that's not the right message. That's not what we should do necessarily. But if you think about those two messages, which is more likely to resonate with people? Not with the message sender, but the message receiver. Right? We have to think about the way they're designed, the way they're going to receive our message. One of these is more like the broccoli, I think, and one of these is more like the cheeseburger. And so the question very simply I'm going to ask us is, how do we get around this curse of knowledge? Right? We know a lot about things. We know the right information. But sometimes we assume, that's the curse of knowledge, that everyone else knows the same thing. And you know what? They don't. No one is going to listen to us as hard as we are. No one knows as much information as we do. And so when sharing information, we have to get beyond this curse of knowledge. How can we create messages not only that we like and understand, but that our audience can like, understand, and pass on to someone else? 
If you ever remember playing the telephone game when you're a kid, right? You share a message to someone, they don't remember everything. They remember some things, they pass it on, remember some things, they pass it on. Eventually, at the end, the message looks a little bit different than it started out with. How can we design messages so that the information we want to be there at the end gets there? And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Specifically, how can we make our messages tastier? How can we design those effective messages? How can we spread the word that good architecture improves lives? That's the good broccoli. But how do we make it tastier so that it'll resonate with the people listening to it? How do we make people messengers, including ourselves, but also our own constituents in the areas we work in? And then finally, a little more selfishly, how do we use these tools to grow our own businesses? Right, I'll talk about two key areas today. How do we use word of mouth to grow, build a social movement around the good work that architecture's doing, both in the public as well as public policymakers, but also how do we use those same tools of word of mouth to grow our businesses? But before I talk about these things, I'm gonna ask you one more question. And again, get your minds working a little bit. These are three products or brands that everyone in the room is probably quite familiar with. We have Walt Disney World, the self-described place where dreams come true. We have uh, the delicious breakfast cereal, Honey Nut Cheerios. And last but not least, we have Scrubbing Bubbles. Does everyone know Scrubbing Bubbles? For those who don't, it's a bathroom cleaner. It's a very effective uh, bathroom cleaner. If you had to guess, which of these three products or brands do you think gets the most word of mouth? Is it Disney, is it Cheerios, or is it Scrubbing Bubbles? And I'm gonna ask everybody to vote. So a number of people say Disney. How many for Disney? <coughs> okay, looks like about 80, 85% of the room. I think I heard of Bubbles maybe somewhere. How many for Bubbles? Oh, about five, 10% of the room. Cheerios? Okay, maybe about five, four, five percent of the room. I wanna point out two things uh, here. This was a little tougher than the broccoli and the cheeseburger, right? No one was jumping the gun, oh, I wanna be the first person to get out there. I looked around some of the faces up front, I can't see everybody, the lights are a little bright, but some of you looked scared. Like you had no idea how to answer this question. You're like, what, what do you mean which of these three gets more word of mouth? I have no clue. And in fact, right, this is sort of a cheap party trick, because one's gonna win, two are gonna lose. The answer doesn't really matter to you unless you work with one of these three companies, which you probably don't. So you're standing there going, why does this matter to me? But the why is really important. Because if we don't understand why one of these brands gets talked about more, why one of these products gets talked about more, how do we expect to get people to share our message? If we don't understand that science behind word of mouth, how do we expect to get people talking and sharing? Which brings me to my second point. I think Disney was the highest vote getter, yes? So how many for Disney? Okay, excellent, excellent guess. Unfortunately, it's wrong, but good guess. Uh, Scrubbing Bubbles, I think, was our runner-up. That makes a little more sense. Bubbles, great guess also, also wrong. The answer's Cheerios, the one that the fewest of us guessed. And while this is a cheap parlor trick, I think it points out something very interesting. Our intuition about why people talk about and share things might be wrong. If we're gonna be effective messengers, we have to understand how to build effective messages. And so that's a very long-winded introduction to a title slide, but it was nicely mentioned. I'm Jonah Berger, uh, I'm a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. What I'll do today in the sort of 40 minutes we have together is give you a brief tour of some of the highlights of my recent New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Contagious, Why Things Catch On. Uh, everything I talk about today will be based on rigorous academic research. I've spent the last 15 years in this space uh, studying why things catch on, why people share information, but what I will not do today is put up a table with lots of statistics. I found that that is a great way either to put people to sleep or to get people to find something much more interesting on their phone. So I'm gonna tell stories today because stories are the currency of conversation. But everything I'm gonna talk about today is based on rigorous science. It's all in the back of the book. If you wanna find the papers that are, these ideas are based on, they're at jonaberger.com. We'll have time at the end for questions, at least a few of them. If you don't get time for questions, feel free to find me at j1berger on Twitter. And I'll also be signing some books out there uh, at the end of the session. So uh, just to jump right in with something I think is obvious to many people in the room, but in case it's not obvious to you, I put a quote up about it. Uh, and it's not my quote, because sometimes if I say something, you might say, ah, it was cute, but I don't really know if to believe it. But if a major consulting firm said it, it must be true, right? If they said it, I mean, it must be true. Word of mouth is much more impactful than traditional advertising, right? And I think we all know this. If you think about the last book you read, the last movie you watched, uh, how you found a babysitter or a dog walker, or even maybe the last car you bought, we often find out this information from others. And indeed, a great deal of academic research shows that a dollar spent on word of mouth goes about 10 times as far as a dollar spent on traditional advertising. And by traditional advertising, by the way, I don't just mean a television ad, because many of you are sitting there going, well, we don't do television ads. It's any communication that comes from a company or organization. Whether it's a website, whether it's an email, whether it's something in print, anything that's company generated rather than individually generated. 
There are two key reasons why word of mouth is more impactful. Any idea why? Any idea what one of those reasons might be? Heard somebody over here say trust. What do you mean by trust? Okay. And you don't trust companies or organizations as much? Yeah. And, and we can think about why that is. So a great example of this happened during the football season. Do you guys remember uh, Joe Montana? Famous 49er quarterback Joe Montana. So Joe Montana was in an ad for these Skechers shoes called Shape Ups. And you may not know what Shape Ups are. They are these shoes that you wear that theoretically at least, I doubt there's any scientific evidence, but will tone your rear end. So it is you wear these shoes around and somehow magically you will get a toned rear end. Imagine you saw Hall of Fame quarterback Joe Montana saying, I love these shoes. What would you think? I remember thinking, oh, wow, things must be uh, really bad in the, in the Joe Montana household right now. He's got to owe somebody a lot of money, right? He's got a gambling debt, something. You see Shaquille O'Neal doing ads for gold bond powder. You wonder what happened to him. He used to be such a great basketball player. Um, and if the point, as your colleague pointed out, is we know that companies or organizations are trying to change our mind. And because of that, we push back, right? When an organization says, hey, we're a really important cause, we do great work, no organization out there is going to say, you know what? We are not an important cause. We are like the 17th most important cause out there. Here are 16 other more important causes. You should give them more money and support. And after them, if you're done with them, then you can go find us. Everybody says their message or idea is important. But because of that, when it comes from a company or organization, people don't know whether to believe it or not. But when it comes from a friend, a colleague, someone we know, we're much more likely to trust it because we know they're not trying to sell us anything. They're not trying to persuade us, so we're much more likely to believe that message. That's the first benefit, the trust, the benefit, credibility of word of mouth. The second is a little more nuanced. That's the targeting benefit of word of mouth. How do we find people that might support our cause? How do we find people that might want to work with an architect? How do we find individuals who might believe in our social movement? Well, it's tough to do, right? It's tough to know exactly who might like what we have to offer. But that's exactly what word of mouth does. A couple of years ago, I got a book in the mail. Publishers often send academics books with the hopes that we'll assign them to our students and they'll sell more copies in the process. But this time they sent me two copies of exactly the same book. I sat there and I said, okay, they look the same. I flipped through some pages, I looked at the margins, okay, they're exactly the same. Why the second book? And finally I got close to the end and there was a little sticky note. I said, hey, Professor Berger, we think you'll like this book, but we think you'll also know someone else who will like this book. Pass the second copy on to them. And that's the first very simple hack I'm gonna share with you this morning. How about turning customers, clients, individuals into advocates, people that like you already into advocates, can you get them to spread the word for you? Because if you get someone who likes you already to spread the word, they won't spread it to anyone. They'll go through their social network like a searchlight to find the person or people that'll find your message and your information most relevant. They'll find someone else who's interested in it. If someone's worked with a great architect, they're not gonna tell someone else who doesn't need an architect. They're gonna tell someone who might find that message valuable. They'll do the targeting for you. A right, great example of this happened uh, this holiday season. So you may have heard that Uber's going through some PR problems, uh, but they sent out an email to many of their people uh, saying, hey, Uber rider, uh, you can request a free ride for your guests here. That's cute. Aren't they really pro-social and helpful? But notice what they're also doing. They're saying, hey, person that likes Uber, we'd like your help in figuring out who you might know who likes Uber, might like Uber. Someone who doesn't know about us already, hasn't used us before, but might like our service. They're getting those existing customers to do the targeting for them. How can we do the same thing? By turning our clients, by turning our members into advocates, can we get them to spread the word? And so that's gonna be the, the goal here today. When we think about it though, hopefully now I've convinced you the value of word of mouth, now how do we get it? When we think about word of mouth, we often think about online. We think about Facebook, we think about Twitter, we think about LinkedIn, we think about blogs, online reviews. If you had to guess, out of all word of mouth, from 100%, let's say, all the way down to zero, what percent of word of mouth would you guess is online? From 100% down to zero. How much would you guess? Somebody pick a number. 40, 90, 5, 17. We've got a good spread here. We've got 5 to 90. Does anyone want to go below 5? I feel like an auctioneer. Anyone want to go above 90? Uh, the answer is 7. 7% 7 of word of mouth is online. And it's important to put that number in context. Does that mean that online isn't important? No, but it means that most of the talking and sharing people do is still face-to-face, -face, right? Talking to breakfast with your family, lunch with your colleagues at work, dinner or drinks after work with uh, friends and the like. Most word of mouth is face-to-face. -face. 
right? And by focusing so much on the technology, the newest, hottest, cool tool that we think people share through, we forgot about something much more important, the psychology. Because if we don't understand why people share messages, it doesn't matter what technology we're using, no one will share our message. We have to build a message people want to share. There's a great cartoon that I think illustrates this well. So it's at a funeral, uh, and someone says he had over 2,000 Facebook friends. I was expecting a bigger turnout. Uh, <coughs> and I've worked with a lot of companies and organizations who are expecting the same thing. They were sitting there going, ah, if we just collect friends and followers online, we're done. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we don't need to worry about what we're sharing. If we're on those technologies, we'll be successful. And that's just plain wrong. If we don't build messages that people want to share, it doesn't matter how persuasive we think we are or how many friends or followers we have, no one's going to share our message. To get them to share our message, we have to understand the science of sharing. And you might think it's random, luck, or chance, why people share things. It's not. I spent the last 15 years studying these things. We've looked at thousands of pieces of online content, six months of New York Times articles, everything written by the newspaper to understand what makes the most emailed list and what doesn't. We've looked at tens of thousands of brands and millions of purchases across the United States. And again and again, we see the same six factors come up. The same six drivers cause people to talk about and share information. If we are going to be effective messengers, we have to build effective messages. I put them in a framework called STEPS. Uh, if you're paying attention, you will notice that STEPS is spelled incorrectly. Uh, that is because I'm not very clever. So I spent a long time with these six ideas, trying to move them around and change them into a different acronym. Eventually, I gave up. Uh, the book is out now in about few hundred thousand copies in over 35 languages. I can't take them back. We are stuck with steps. Uh, but that stands for social currency, triggers, emotion, public, practical value, and stories. Each of those is a driver of why people share information. I'll cover at least three, maybe four of them today. You can read about the rest in the book. I'll give you a couple examples to think about how to apply the ideas. But the goal here at the end of the day, I hope you enjoy this talk, but the goal is to give you a toolkit. I want you to walk out of here going, I know one or two ways to make my message more effective. And I see many of you taking notes, that's great. Happy to answer questions at the end. But be thinking along the way, okay, social currency, how do I apply that to what I'm doing? And I'll do a little bit of tying the loop there, connecting the dots, but I'm encouraging you to do the same thing and I, I hope we do more of that in the question session as well. Uh, and one more thing before I go further. When we think about ideas like this, word of mouth, we think about things going viral. We think about things like the Ice Bucket Challenge. How many of you did the Ice Bucket Challenge, by the way? Okay, good, good number. Um, and we think about viral. And viral is a good thing to think about in some ways. Right? The principles I'll talk about today explain why things go viral on the web. But that's not actually our goal. Because viral is often a flash in the pan. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Right? What does the fox say it was amazingly successful for about a week? There's a few hundred million views, really, really popular. And then no one heard from those guys again. Right? I don't know what they're doing right now. They may be counting their money or they may be unemployed. I have no idea. Right? We don't want to be an organization that creates one successful messages and a whole bunch of failures for the rest of our lives. We want to create ongoing, enduring word of mouth for what we're doing. And so the goal is not a flash in the pan and then to disappear. A better analogy is a batting average. How can we raise our batting average? How can we increase the chance that each person that works with us tells just one more person about the important work that architects do? Just one more individual, not 10 to 20 million views, but 10 to 20% new customers, new followers, new people joining our movement. That's the goal, right? Whether someone has 10 friends or 10,000, whether a message reaches 10 person or 10 million, how do we encourage people to share? Right, a batting average is a good analogy because even if someone who's good at hitting doesn't hit a home run every time. They hit some singles, some doubles, some triples, they get on base more often. That's our goal. How do we raise our batting average? And that's what I'm doing right here. That's what I'll share us with the tools to do. So you're sitting there going, I can't make an ice bucket challenge, don't worry. Too many organizations sit there going, ah, ice bucket challenge, we should do something similar. Let's do a mustard squirting challenge. I'm not joking, Our organization really did, oh, we should have mustard squirting challenge, people squirt other people with mustard and donate money. I, I felt exactly like you did hearing that. I said, wow, all right. And so too often we copy the surface characteristics of things that are successful without understanding the why. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, understanding that why. Let me start with a story. How many of you are from New York? Maybe the New York delegation all sitting together. Okay, good. Uh, you guys may know this story for the rest of you. Uh, next time you're in New York, you can check it out. But imagine you're walking around sort of the Lower East Side, Alphabet City. Your stomach is rumbling. You're hungry. You got a bed a bite to eat. When you notice a big hot dog shaped sign out in front of a restaurant with the words eat me written on it in what looked like mustard. I haven't had a hot dog in a while. I'll check this place out. So you walk down a flight of stairs into a restaurant called Criff Dogs. 
Now, if you like hot dogs, you will be in heaven. Crypt Dogs has every hot dog you can imagine. Uh, it has a good morning hot dog with bacon, eggs, and cheese. I don't know that anyone would want to eat a hot dog for breakfast, even if you love hot dogs, but they're interesting nonetheless. A uh, hot dog with green onion and pineapple, and a traditional New York style water dog with just ketchup and mustard. So you're sitting there, you're munching on your hot dog, and you notice something unusual in the corner of the screen. Over there to the far left, almost looks like a phone booth. Like one of those things that Clark Kent might uh, jump into to change into Superman. So just for fun, slide open that door and walk inside. It's pretty cramped. It's a phone booth, after all. But on the wall, you'll see something most of us probably haven't seen in 20 years. Do you remember rotary dial phones? Maybe 30 years. Stick your finger and you go around in a circle just for fun. Stick the finger and say number three. Go around in a circle and hold the receiver up to your ear. Well, the phone will actually ring. It'll go ring, ring. And then someone will pick up the other line and they'll ask you whether you have a reservation. I remember the first time I heard this story going, reservation? We're in a phone booth inside of a hot dog restaurant. What could you possibly have a reservation for? But if you're lucky and they happen to have a space or a friend of yours happened to make a reservation, the back of that phone booth will open and you'll be led into a secret bar called Please Don't Tell. Now, Please Don't Tell has violated a number of traditional laws of marketing or communication, right? There's no sign inside the street, no sign inside the restaurant. They've done everything they can to make themselves difficult to find. Yet every day they're full. 3 p.m., phone lights open up. By 3.30, all the seats are gone. You have to hit redial again and again and again trying to get through. I finally got through one day. I got a seat at like 7.30 on a Tuesday night after two weeks of calling. And it's not for a lack of competition, right? Lots of competition out there, similar things in the neighborhood. So why were they so successful? Well, they did something very interesting. They made themselves a secret. And let me tell you a little secret about secrets. Think about the last time someone told you something and they told you not to tell anybody else. <laughs> What's the first thing you then did with that information? You told somebody, right? Because having access to information that not everyone else does makes you look smart and makes you look in the know. It gives you what I'll call social currency. Just like the car we drive and the clothes we wear, the things we say and the things we share affect how other people see us. And I think we're really good, used to people used to saying, well, how can I make myself look good? But this is a slightly different idea. How can I make the people I'm talking to look good? Because the better I can make them look, the more they'll talk about me to look good to others. And the more my message will come along for the ride. Being an effective messenger isn't just about making you, the messenger, look good. It's about making the message recipient look good. So let's spend a couple minutes talking about this idea of social currency. To do that, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. Her name is Carla, and all I'm going to tell you about her is that this is a picture of her car. And I want to see how much you can guess about Carla just based on that piece of information. Okay, that's it. So if you had to guess, uh, I don't know, how old she is. How, many, how, how old would you guess that Carla is? How many people would say between 35 and, and 45? Okay, does she have any kids? They play sports? What sport do they play? Right. Was there a, a cheat sheet outside by those chicken apple sausages <laughs> that, I, that I didn't notice? I don't think so, right? We made these inferences because choices communicate information. Car we drive, also the clothes we wear. I thought a lot about what to wear to come see you guys today. Right? I've been told I have a young face. I'm not as young as I look. I've been teaching at the Wharton School now for about eight years. But I know that I have a young face, so I always wear a sport coat blazer to show that I'm professional. So you think that I'm at least 23 rather than 18, and at least I have my own credit card and can buy my own clothes. Uh, but if I came in here wearing shorts and a t-shirt, you probably wouldn't take me seriously. The content would be equally useful, but you'd say, oh, well, I'm going to make inferences about him based on what we're wearing. People do that all the time. What we drive, what we wear, but also what we talk about and share. I think about what people pass on online in particular, right? They curate an online identity based on how they want to look to others. You want to be the first person to know sports if you care about sports, first person to know about building and environmental issues if you care about that. Depending on what domain you care about, what you talk about is a signal of that domain. Very simply, how can we give people desired signals? And so I talk about about four or five ways to do it in the book. Here I'll talk about three. The first is how can we make people feel like insiders? Smart, special, in the know, like they're not like everybody else. Right? Please don't tell did a great job at that. A bar hidden inside a hot dog restaurant? Wow, of course you want to talk about that. Right? Many people probably wrote it down for the next time they're in New York or to tell their friends, because it makes you look special, like you know something that not everyone else knows. Right? Same thing happens all the time LinkedIn. 
did a great message a few years ago. Sent it out to a number of people uh, that are LinkedIn members saying, you have one of the top profiles on LinkedIn. Top 5% or top 10% of profiles. People felt really good when they got that message, but they didn't just feel good. Many of them shared it with others in their social network. Tens of thousands of people shared the message because they wanted to say, look at me, I'm an influencer on LinkedIn. Right? But along the way, LinkedIn comes along for the ride. How can we make people that might not know everything about architecture, how can we give them a little information to make them feel a little smarter so the next time they go to that cocktail party, they have something to say? The next time someone brings up something about green buildings or about architecture, about trends in the industry, they don't have to be a genius about architecture. They're not going to get there, right? But give them a little bit of information so they feel smart. Just like you feel like when you read an interesting article in the New York Times, you go to a party, you can talk about it. How can we give them that tidbit that they can roll out that makes them look good, right? And if you think about books like Architecture for Dummies, why do books like that exist? They exist because not everybody has the time to get a degree in architecture, but people want to know a little bit, the, the cliff notes. Right? The small details to make them look a little smarter when they meet somebody else. How can we help them give them those details? We give people those short little messages they can pass on, they'll look good, and they'll pass on our message for us. Another way is to leverage what I'll call game mechanics or gamification. And if you think about it, many things in life are designed a little bit like games. Think about frequent flyer programs, for example. Right? If you've ever flown recently and you hear two people talk about, oh, I'm a gold platinum this or a platinum executive that, and you look at what the actual benefits are, you get like a free bag once in a while and sometimes you get upgraded, but people love to talk about it. Love to talk about it, right? I love hearing frequent flyers go back and forth about how special and whatever level they are. And what they're really saying is, look at me, I'm busy, I'm a frequent traveler, I'm important. But no one's gonna say, look at me, I'm important. Because they, like, no one would wanna talk to that person. So they say, look at me, I have this status. Look at me, I fly this way. It's a way, a level to allow them to communicate status. We see the same thing, right, with uh, green building certification with LEED, right? People don't necessarily even understand what those are, but as soon as we put something in place where there's lower and there's higher, people want to get the higher tiers. They love talking about it and they love bragging about it to others because it's a way to say where they are in a hierarchy, right? How can we create systems like that that allow people to communicate where they are in a position? And some of you may have seen this and going, this standard is ridiculous, it's not right, it's not correct. But think about, again, right, to that broccoli and that cheeseburger idea. Sometimes it's not the most correct things that succeed. We have to understand why people share things and build things that are going to be effective. And then last but not least, in terms of social currency, how can we find what I'll call the inner remarkability? And this is really important. Some things we think certain messages are naturally remarkable and others are doomed to fail. So we say, hey, you know, certain things are surprising and novel and interesting. That's great, a hidden bar, but I could never do this. Right? You're sitting there going, you know, I could never do this with an architecture message. I mean, a hidden bar, sure, but an architecture message, that wouldn't really work. Right, you could think it's not the same thing, it's not a physical product, it's very different. You could say the same thing about lots of messages, right? How do we get people, for example, to drink less soda, right? There's a lot of sugar in soda, how do we communicate that effectively? Let me show you one example of an organization that did a really good job communicating that message. I realize that's a tough video to show this time of morning. I apologize. It's a little, little early for graphic fat depictions. Should have like a rated R message on it or something like that. Um, you would think that, oh, sugar and soda. Everybody knows there's sugar and soda. There is nothing exciting or interesting about this message. 10 million people viewed this content by the last time I looked online. Right? The message, the idea there's sugar and soda is the same, but they figured out how to show that message rather than tell that message. They didn't just say, hey, you know what, let me tell you there's a lot of sugar and soda. They showed people how much sugar and soda, literally showed them with blobs of fat falling on a plate. How can we show people rather than tell people? Because when we say architecture is important, people go, okay, that's, how can we show people how important architecture is? How can we show people what the world would look like if it wasn't around? How can we show people how much better life is because of well-designed buildings? We need to figure out how to show rather than tell. We find that inner remarkability. Any message can be remarkable if we show people rather than, than tell people. So that's social currency, and I know I went through it a little quickly, but I think those ideas are somewhat intuitive. I want to talk about a concept that's very different, but equally important. And now we've got through the S in steps, we'll talk about the T for triggers. 
Uh, and to talk about triggers, I want to use an ad that many of you have probably seen recently. How many of you have seen uh, the Geico Hump Day ad? Okay. For those who haven't and are wondering uh, what this is, I will reenact it very briefly, and I will do a bad job, but here it goes. There's a camel walking through an office, a very annoying camel. What day is it today, guys? What day is it? What day is it? No one listens to the camel. He's annoying. Finds this poor woman. He goes, what day is it? She goes, it's hump day. The camel goes, woo woo. Uh, the ad goes, how happy are people who save money with Geico? Happier than a camel on hump day, Wednesday. Happier than a camel on hump day. Camels, humps, get it? You're supposed to laugh at my jokes. Come on, give it a, give it a little shot. Thank you, I appreciate it. Maybe I didn't do a very good job of telling this uh, ad if you've seen it. But if you watch it, it's actually not that funny. It's a little funny, but it's not that funny. Yet this is the second most shared ad of last year. And not the second most shared insurance ad, because you're probably sitting there going, well, sharing an insurance ad, nobody shares insurance ads. Second most shared ad, period, of all ads out there. So why did so many people share this message? Well, I'm a data guy. I dug a little deeper. I worked with a company called Unruly. This is what the share data looks like over time. There's a spike in shares, and then it goes down. And another spike, then it goes down, and another spike, then it goes down. If you look closer, the spikes aren't random. They're seven days apart. And if you look even closer, you'll notice that they're every Wednesday, or as it's colloquially known, hump day. This content is equally good every day of the week, or bad, depending on your preferences, right? It's good or bad on Monday, it's good or bad on Tuesday, it's good or bad on Wednesday. But Wednesday rolls around, provides a ready reminder, what psychologists would call a trigger, to make people think about and talk about and share the message. Because if something is top of mind, it's much more likely to be tip of tongue. Too often when we think about designing effective message, we think about, well, how much do people like this message? When they hear it, do they like it? Do they say that it resonates with them? But it's not just whether they like a message. If they never think about that message, it's never going to change behavior, right? There may be a restaurant in the town you live in, for example, you've been meaning to go to, but if you never think about it near the time when you're going out to eat, you'll never go there, right? It has to be top of mind for us to talk about it and for us to use it. Some psychologists did a great study in the, in the grocery store, maybe now about 10 years ago. Some days they played French music, and some days they played German music. What'd they find? Well, on days they played French music, sales of French wine went up. And on days they played German music, well, sales of German wine went up. Was it the music changed what wine people liked? No, people still like whatever wine they like. It just reminded them to buy that wine. Oh, there's French music? Oh, it reminds me of French wine. I should pick some up. The trigger reminded people to take action. We not only have to have a good message that people like, we have to have one that reminds them, we have to be reminded to think about it. So here's a little more data. Uh, this is the word of mouth about Cheerios by time of day. What do you notice about when people talk about Cheerios? Breakfast, right? When they're eating breakfast. You notice how it shifted to the right on the weekend? Any idea why? Get up later. All right, this is not rocket science. People think about a product, a service, an idea, when they have just used that product, service, or idea. When someone has just recently worked with you, you've completed a project, that's great, you're top of mind. But here's the problem. Notice what happens the rest of the day. Right? Cheerios is no longer top of mind, and people don't talk about it anymore. This is the problem with Disney World. Disney World is a really engaging experience. But how many of you have been to Disney World? Not ever, but this year. One, two, three. Some of you are great parents. Uh, for the younger folks, maybe you got married there, uh, or I, I guess you're just weird. I think those are the three reasons that people go to Disney World. If you're not a parent, you didn't get married there, what are you doing by yourself at Disney World? Uh, Disney World is a really engaging experience, but people don't remember to think about it because they don't go very often and nothing in the environment reminds them to think about it when they're not there. Cheerios is pretty boring, right? Not the most exciting thing in the world, but people have breakfast once a day, 365 days a year. And even if they don't eat Cheerios, they wheel their cart through the grocery store once in a while, right? Once every week, couple weeks, they see the brand, it's top of mind. So how can we think of other triggers beyond usage, even if someone hasn't worked with an architect recently, to remind them of our message. Well, good news, there are other triggers as well. So if I said peanut butter and, you might think of the word jelly. Or if I said rum and, you might think of Coke. Notice that peanut butter is like a little advertisement for jelly. It's almost like jelly should pay peanut butter a kickback, or like a referral fee or something every time peanut butter's around. Because if peanut butter's there, jelly doesn't have to remind you it exists. Peanut butter does all the work for jelly. Right, we all know that old slogan, weekends are made for Michelob. Well, why did Michelob use that? They wanted people to think about the beer every time the weekend rolled around. Corona's done the same thing with the beach. I challenge you to go on a beach vacation and never think about Corona. 
pretty much impossible, right? You're lying there on the beach, you got your sunscreen on, you're reading your book. You might not even like beer, you might hate Corona, but suddenly Corona comes to mind. And what does Corona always have in it when it comes to mind? Lime in it. How does that work? Is that random luck chance? No. The beach is Corona's trigger. The beach is essentially Corona's peanut butter. And so I'm going to ask you a very simple question here. Think about how to apply this to your own messages. What is your peanut butter? What's the thing in the environment that's going to remind people of you even when you're not around? Because you can send them emails, you can call them on the phone, you can remind them, hey, we exist, hey, share our message, hey, care about us. But if you link your idea to a peanut butter in the environment, every time they see that peanut butter, they'll think of your jelly. We got college students to eat 25% more fruits and vegetables by using a, a message to remind them to eat fruits and vegetables by linking it to something in their environment. It wasn't a message they thought was effective, it wasn't very cute, but every time they saw that thing in their environment, they thought about our message and it reminded them to change their behavior. More triggered, more often, more top of mind, more likely to change behavior. Uh, Kit Kat did a great job of this a few years ago. So sales were down by about 30%. People liked Kit Kat, they weren't buying it. They came out with a very simple slogan, Kit Kat and coffee, a break's best friend. Having a coffee break? Have a Kit Kat. Thinking about coffee? Think about Kit Kat. Coffee and Kit Kat, Kit Kat and coffee, best friends forever. If you're Kit Kat, why is coffee a really good trigger, a really good peanut butter to link yourself to? Why coffee? Frequency. Right? If we want it to come to mind more often, linking it to something more frequent is better than less frequent. Weekends are made for Michelob was originally holidays are made for Michelob. But they moved it to the weekend because they wanted to think people to think about it more often. But it's not just frequency. Think for a moment about reusable grocery bags. How many people have reusable grocery bags somewhere in their home? Everybody. Okay. I think you know where this is going. Leave your hand up if you use them every time you go to the grocery store. Okay, you, you guys are better people than me. But where did the rest of us go? Right? Why did we forget our bags? Think for a moment. When do you remember reusable grocery bags? Which last time I checked is too late. Right? You're not going to go back home to get your bags to come back to the store. Right? You hit yourself on the head. You say, I'll remember next time, and then what happens next time? You remember when you get to the store. Reusable grocery bags have a peanut butter, but it's in the wrong place. Right? It's too late by the time you get to the store. And so the question to ask yourself is, who do we want to think about our message? Who do we want to be triggered? When do we want them to be triggered? When do we want to come to mind? And what is in the environment around that time? What's the right peanut butter to help us uh, come to mind? I'll spend a few minutes talking about emotion, uh, and then I'll wrap up by talking about stories, and I'll take some questions. Uh, and here I want to talk about uh, a dog named Ruby. Uh, so I'm an avid cyclist, uh, not a motorcyclist, but a bicyclist, uh, and was going on a long ride in Philadelphia a couple uh, years ago in, in the winter, probably January or February. I was riding through a big uh, park they have there called Fairmont Park, and I noticed this really cute dog running around in circles near this parking lot. And at the time, I didn't have a dog. I love dogs. Um, and I said, oh, a really cute dog. And then I noticed no one was in the parking lot. Oh, someone's lost their dog. So er, put the brakes on my bike, walk over. I've got my cell phone, thinking I'll call the number on the collar. Someone will come pick up the dog, and they'll have their dog back. Get really close. This dog is super happy, bounding up on me, putting its paws on me. But I notice it doesn't have a collar on. And I look closer. Its ribs are sucked in. It's got sores on its body. Someone has left this dog in the park to fend for itself. Now, at the time, I could not have a dog myself. I lived in an apartment building, did not allow dogs. So I called at my local animal shelter. I said, hey, guys, found this dog. Can you come pick it up and find it a good home? They said, sure, we can come pick up the dog. But unfortunately, we're pretty full. We might have to kill the dog. I'm not letting you pick up this dog so you can kill the dog, right? I've got to do something about it. So with the help of a friend, we gave the dog its shots. Nursed it back to health, gave it about six or seven baths to get rid of the fleas. We had to find somebody to adopt this dog. So I sent an email out to all my colleagues, very simply with the subject line, free dog. It's got all of its shots. It's in my house. It's ready to go. Come pick it up whenever, whenever you're ready. Good news, somebody picked up the dog, but it wasn't someone I emailed or someone they forwarded the email or someone that forwarded to the email. It was a fourth degree of separation. Someone sent it to someone who sent it to someone else who sent it to someone else who eventually picked up this great dog and named it Ruby, and now it lives in New Jersey and has a happy life. Why did so many people share this message? And would they have done the same thing if very simply, I sent out a very similar email saying, hey, I'm moving this weekend. We can't fit everything in the moving truck. Subject line, free couch. It's got its shots. It's at my house. It's ready to go. Come pick it up. I bet many of you would share the dog message. You wouldn't share the couch message. Why? Because when we care, we're much more likely to share. When we feel emotionally connected to something, we are much more likely to be engaged with that message and pass it along. And I think this is a really important idea for the folks in this audience, right? Because many of us are very good at what we do. We're very good technically. 
We're very good at talking about the functional reasons, the attributes, why people should do something, but sometimes we need to think a little bit more about the emotion. Not just the function, but focus on the feeling. Right? Why are people doing something? Right? Find that emotional core. Right? You can ask why a couple times, why are people building a green building? Why do people care about architecture? Get to the second or third why, keep asking why, you get down to emotional core. They want their employees to be happy. They want their students to enjoy their learning environment and have a more effective learning, be more engaged. Right? Ask why a couple times, you get to a more emotional core. Here's a great example of a company that took something very functional, online search, one of the least uh, feelings oriented things out there, and got people to, to care about it. felt at least a little emotion watching that message. Be honest. I had some of you laughing, I heard some of you sighing. This is about online search. The least emotional thing we can think of. <laughs> this is about figuring out what time your flight is coming in and locating things and translating language. They were gonna do something called a search a day where they picked one function each time, they're rolling out a new version of online search. Now you can see this function, you can see that function. Instead, they said, well, let's make a story, an emotional story about why people use online search. And not the first why, why do they use online search? They want to find information. Why do they want to find information? Well, they need to do the things they do in daily life. Why? Well, they want to connect with the people they love and live more satisfying lives. You ask why a couple more times, you get down to what's called an emotional core. Right? You get down to that deep emotional connection and suddenly we see online search is more than just function. Right? There's a feeling, there's an emotional connection there, we're much more likely to pass that message on. We feel, we're connected, we're much more likely to share. Um, I won't talk about which emotions drive sharing more than others. I want to get to the story bit to wrap up. But there are certain emotions, high arousal emotions, that drive sharing more than others. I'll let you read about that in the book. I want to save time for questions. Um, uh, I'll skip this as well and I'll wrap up with stories. Um, okay, so to wrap up with stories. And I've been telling stories all along, uh, but I want to talk about a particular type of story. Uh, and so imagine you're at a party. Maybe there's an event going on tonight or when you get home this weekend there's an event going on. And someone you don't know walks up to you and they say something along the lines of the following. Did you know, my newfound friend, that Subway has five subs under five grams of fat? Did you know, person I just met at a party, that Subway has five subs under five grams of fat? What would you do if someone walked up to you at a party and said, did you know that Subway has five grams of fat? You'd probably say, oh, yeah, it's really interesting. Hey, I left my drink uh, right, right over there. You hang out right here. I'll be back in just a couple minutes. And that person would never see you again, right? Because no one wants to be friends with someone that sounds like a walking advertisement. As much as we love the good work that goes on in architecture, no one's going to share our message if it sounds like an advertisement, right? If it sounds like a blurb written from, uh, you know, something about the mission statement, no one's going to share the mission statement as much as we'll share it, right? We have to build a message that they want to pass on. How can we do that? Well, everyone's heard the Jared story, right? Jared was way overweight in college. He picked his classes based on which ones had big seats, rather than which ones were actually useful for his education. His roommate at the time said, Jared, you are morbidly obese. You gotta do something about it. So he goes on a Subway diet. Subway for lunch, Subway for dinner, every day for months on end. Six inch for lunch, foot long for dinner, veggie sub, tuna sub, cold cut trio, all the great options that they have. Loses over 180 pounds by eating Subway sandwiches. Goes from, I don't know what size pants they are, to much, much smaller, right? Amazing story about losing all that weight by eating fast food. Now that is a remarkable story, but notice it's not just a remarkable story. What did you learn about Subway from just that idle narrative, that chatter? What did you learn about the Subway brand? Yeah, you said five subs under five. Everything in that left side of the screen, they have healthy subs, they have more than one, you can eat there for months on end, is basically inside that story. It's not just a story, it's a vessel or a carrier of information. It's what I'll call a Trojan horse story. 
Right? Good stories not only have an engaging exterior, but they carry messages or ideas along for the ride. Think back of the story of the Trojan horse. Right? Greeks, Trojans, nobody can win. They build a wooden horse. They hide their men inside. Good stories are like that. Right? That story about the guy I showed you earlier, drinking the soda, all that fat, right? Carries the message that, oh, you know, you don't want to drink too much soda. Think about stories, right? Stories uh, like the boy who cried wolf. You want someone not to lie, you tell them don't lie, they say, oh, okay. They sort of remember, maybe they pay attention. You tell them the story of the boy who cried wolf, you tell a kid that story, they pay attention to the end because they want to figure out what happens to the boy. But notice what happens along the way. They learn that lying is a bad idea. The vessel, the story, carries a message along for the ride. How can we create stories that carry our messages? Because people aren't just going to share a message. They need a story or a vessel to carry it in. Let me show you my favorite example of this. It's called panda cheese. Now, you're probably wondering at this point, cheese made from panda milk? I did not think that was possible. I don't think it's possible either. This is not cheese made from panda milk. I think uh, you'd have to run very quickly and wear a lot of padding if you wanted to try to milk a panda. Uh, this is an Egyptian company called Panda that makes cheese. And I want you to watch what they do in their ads to communicate their key message. Take a look, and I'll, I'll narrate a little bit because it's not in English. Please. Family like bison, what you get me? No, I'm not hungry. Just you know why. I'll show you a couple of these. Good morning. Good morning. I got your panda cheese for breakfast. No, I love it. Thanks. I don't feel well. You know why. Never say no to Panda. <laughs> and last but not least, Daddy, why don't we get some Panda? Just you know why. Get one. Why you and I? Okay, uh, just to wrap up, today we talked about the six key steps to boosting word of mouth. And I think the idea here is pretty simple, right? Each of you is a great architect. That's why you're here. But you're also here because now you're a volunteer community leader. You're a grassroots leader. You not need to learn not only how to be a great architect, but to be how a great message designer. How can we design effective messages that people will share? And today we talked about a toolkit that will help us do that. Six key steps. Social currency. How can we make people feel smart, special, and in the know? Like they're not like everybody else. Like they have a little tidbit that makes them look good. Triggers, top of mind, tip of tongue. What's your peanut butter? What's the thing in the environment that will remind people of your message and make sure they pass it on? Emotion, when we care, we share. I didn't touch on the two Ps, but I'll let you read about them, public and practical value. And last but not least, stories. Stories are the currency of communication. They're the way that people convey ideas. I hope you enjoyed the talk today. Hope you found it useful. But notice what you remember a week from now about this great conference. Notice the ideas that you remember. Most of them will have been shared as stories. Because when people put their kids to bed at night, people don't tell bedtime facts. Doesn't happen. Nobody tells bedtime facts. So why do we think that facts are somehow the right way to communicate? Facts are good, but we need to wrap them in stories. We need to use stories to carry those facts along for the ride. And that's why I showed you Please Don't Tell. Or sorry, uh, the panda, panda cheese. Why did I show you that? I showed you because it's funny. That's great. But notice it's not just funny. I challenge you to tell someone else about that message and not mention a particular word. 
And that word is Panda, which is exactly the brand that they want you to remember. They didn't just do something funny. They didn't just build a story. They built a vessel that carries their message, their brand, along for the ride. When you're trying to figure out how to be an effective messenger, what's that story? What's that Trojan horse that'll carry your message? One last thing from me. Uh, today we talked about the six steps, how to apply them. But last but not least, I want us to think about the take homes for this particular idea. Looks like the clicker is not clicking. Ah, there we go, two key next steps. I noticed many of you taking notes, long conference, lots of great ideas. You'll get back to the office. What do I do next with this particular set of ideas? So two things. First, what's your kernel? If we have to put something in that Trojan horse story, what is that thing? If you had people tell one message, your constituents tell one message, the people that work with them or work with you tell one message, what would that message be? What would that short, pithy idea be that they could pass on? What's that kernel? And then second, how can we apply the steps around that kernel to make people more likely to share it? And we don't need to do all six at once. If you're sitting there going, oh God, I don't know where to start, pick one at a time. Pick off social currency, find your peanut butter, whatever it is, pick one of these ideas. And in case it's helpful, uh, there's a free resource on my website, just donorburger.com slash resources. There's a workbook that'll ask you some questions to work you through applying these ideas, each of the six of the things, right? each of the six steps. Because again, very simply, it's not random, it's not luck, and it's not chance. There's a science behind why messages get shared. If we understand that science, we can craft contagious content, we can build a, a social movement around our cause, and we get our ideas to catch on. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions or not? Yeah, we're going to do a Q&A. Thank I'm you. I'm going to address people with the mic. Fantastic. So thank you, Jonah. Yeah. I think that was right on point. Uh, all enjoyed that, I hope. So we do have some uh, time for questions. Uh, we have a uh, mic set up in the audience. Um, we do have one rule about the questions, which uh, relates specifically to Washington. No filibusters, okay? Uh, leave that to Congress. We want to give as many people a chance to speak as possible. So, um, questions? I didn't dress in a panda suit, but the, uh, I wanted one once I saw that. Because Someone actually made me a great panda t-shirt that I wear sometimes. Uh, is there, uh, someone raise your hand if you're looking for a mic and I can point one out near you. There's one right there. There's one, okay, there go, we go. Go right ahead. Hello. I want to know, Jonah, um, great talk. Really Thank wonderful. You. Have you seen our I Look Up campaign, and could you give us some feedback on it? If you I have, have not. Tell me about oh. the I Look Up campaign. <laughs> oh, someone else needs to do this who worked on it. He's, there's a, well, I, I would say on I Look Up, <laughs> um, so what's the peanut butter to architects? Come on. <laughs> Architecture. Can't have architecture and architects. To me, that, made, that validated the I look up, which is you're looking at buildings. They're everywhere, even ugly ones like this. Yeah, and I think one of the... <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and I think one of the challenges, and we were, we were talking about this before, is I think when people see really ugly buildings or really uh, amazing buildings, they think about architecture. When people see all the buildings in between, they don't really think about it as often. I think we want to encourage them to think about any time they see a building, it's well-designed. Sometimes a well-designed building doesn't mean you go, wow, this is amazing. You go, wow, it helps me make my, do my job better. It helps me interact with other people more easily than I would otherwise. Sometimes it's the things you don't see, and so I think making people more aware of that is really, really important. But a great question. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering about ideas the crowd could have about triggers that people experience every day that they wish would get solved, that could get solved by architecture, such as, for example, safe streets, and designing buildings that return with the front porch, uh, sidewalks that are inviting, things like that. that. That's what I'm kind of interested in, in what our trigger could be, because someone's walking down the street every day, and the fact that they don't feel comfortable, I'd like to them to think, geez, architects have answers for this. Yeah, and I think, um, to go back to that idea of a, the curse of knowledge, I think we all realize that architecture solves that problem, but if you ask Joe or Jane consumer on the street, I don't think they realize that architecture can solve safety problems. Most people don't realize that. So the question is, what's a message that helps them realize the solutions that it, that it provides? Right? That they, that's the first thing they think, oh, if this was designed better, it would be more effective. And so how do we encourage them to, to, to think that way? But very good question. I, I, I think a really good before and afters uh, on some of those issues would be great. So right in the middle yeah. there, Emily. Uh, good morning. Um, you did show a building in there, and I tweeted about it. It was the Boston Public Library. I just 
Of course, that's what's interesting to me, because I'm an architect. But I'm curious about this um, idea of, you showed a lot of brands today. Yep. You know, Panda, Cheerios, et cetera, et cetera. And it, architecture as a brand is sometimes a little problematic, because we design for people, and it's also designed by people. Could you speak a little bit about the nuance of the people in architecture becoming the stories versus the buildings or the product of our work being the story? Yeah, and, and you're saying you'd rather it be the product or the, the people is okay? Well, I think it's a, it's a question that we have internally, to be honest, um, because architecture is a group sport, right? Yep. A lot of people have to collaborate. collaborate. We have clients as well. Could you, I'd love to, for you to drill down on that about the person who does the work versus the work and how those triggers and emotions could be sussed out a little bit more. Yeah, and I think, uh, again, and uh, I try to think of these things as what is Joe and Jane consumer, consumer, how do they approach it? I think they know the idea of famous architects. They know when they see a really weird building that an architecture did it, but they don't think of the normal, right? That today, whatever I'm in was probably designed by someone or a, or a team of people. And so I don't think, um, you know, uh, America, United States is very much a fame culture. Right? We treat, any, even team sports, the quarterback in football, we always think is the best player. We never notice the offensive line that makes it possible for the quarterback to do what the quarterback does. Uh, and so I think that's sort of the nature of American culture, to think that individuals are responsible even for group successes. I know that we're going to change that, but I think for me, to go back to the earlier question, the question is how can we encourage people every time they see a building to think about architects, to think about all the great work that went behind it, not just when they see something that's particularly unusual. Um, you know, I think certain buildings become conversation pieces, which is great, it brings architecture to the fore in some good ways and some bad ways. But I think the question is how to make regular everyday architecture a, a conversation piece. And I think some of that is a language issue. If you think about wine, right, some people know about wine, they feel very comfortable talking about wine. But if you don't know anything about wine, you don't feel comfortable talking about it. I think architecture is a little bit like that, right? People don't feel like they know enough, and so they're not very comfortable talking about it. And so one thing I think it's very important if we want to really build grassroots support, true grassroots support, is give people the tools. Right? If they could learn two easy things about architecture that would help them recognize different things, what are those tools that they could walk around on a day-to-day -day basis, see it and find value from, and help them incorporate architecture into the way they, they see the world? Um, yeah? We've got a company in, that started in Georgia that has a really clever uh, peanut butter. Uh, it's called Chick-fil-A. And they use a cow as their peanut butter. Uh, have, have you looked at that? Um, crossover story there like you did on some of these others? Yeah, so um, I haven't looked at Chick-fil-A specifically, um, but, but I think again that, that question of, you know, if every time now you see a cow when you live in Georgia, you think about Chick-fil-A, they've done a really good job. Because now they don't have to remind you, hey, think about Chick-fil-A, hey, go to Chick-fil-A. The cows are doing that work for you. Now that's good in certain parts of the country. In other parts of the country, if you live in New York City, there aren't a lot of cows. Uh, there probably aren't a lot of Chick-fil-A's also, so that's fine for Chick-fil-A. But think about you know, where you live, there may be different triggers in different places. Right? So if you live in California and Florida, you're lucky enough to be graced with palm trees. There are a lot of palm trees in Washington, D.C. And so as you think about triggers, you think about finding that peanut butter, think about in your local communities, you know, that may be different for the different places you live. It may be different also for the different types of people you're trying to get to share, to share your message. Yes, sir. Uh, a lot of what you've shown is advertising. And I never see architects posting their new building on a bus and you know, we're not doing that kind of advertising. So I guess my question is, what is the medium? Because I agree with you that uh, I've been pitched so many times, you gotta get more Facebook pages and likes and Instagram and all this stuff and that's yeah. not the way to go. So as architects, since we're such an, uh, an odd setup, uh, what is the avenue that we should be taking to get out there for the hook? I think that is the key. Is I've actually joined a little uh, business networking group where I can throw the hook out there, but just in the general public, it's very difficult without advertising to do that. So. Yeah, and I think if you take away one thing from the talk today, very simply, is how do I take someone who's worked with me in some capacity, a client, a customer, whatever you, you like to call them, and how do I turn them into an advocate? How do I turn them into someone that not only likes what I do, but shares my message via word of mouth. And so um, I use some examples of advertising today, but a lot of the things like Cheerios, for example, please don't tell, those are companies that are not advertising to get their message shared. It's a lot of word of mouth. And that to me is the key, right? How do we make sure that anyone who's worked with us wants to tell someone else something? Anyone who's learned something about architecture, or even a student who's been in a building, right? Imagine you get a new high school built or a new middle school built, right? That's pretty neat. You're really excited to go into that new building, 
Well, how do we give them a couple tidbits and they can tell their friends, oh, my school was designed or this in particular was done, makes them feel sharp, but allows them to spread the word that architecture is important in that community, right? Using those individuals as advocates, as, as sort of spreaders, as members of our community and our, and our movement. Yeah, all the way in the back there. Good morning. Earlier, I'm gonna rewind a little bit, you mentioned that all, all of the word of mouth, only 7% is online. And I personally was just wondering, is that a generational statistic? I know that a lot of you in this room aren't going to look on Facebook and you probably didn't even post on Facebook you are going out of town because someone might break into your house. But my generation, the first thing we're gonna do is, hey, I have 20 friends that live in DC, what's the best bar I wanna go to on Thursday night? Where's the best place to get Mexican, to get a margarita, you know? So is that, how do we apply that statistic because I know on our state level in Florida, we spend a lot of effort trying to build up our social media and especially appeal to those architecture students and those emerging professionals. Yes, uh, great question. Uh, and you are right that younger people uh, share more word of mouth online than, than older folks. Some of you may be sitting in the room going, oh, the kids today, they're all on the social media, always on their phones. It is higher among young people. Uh, it's about 7% on average total. Uh, among younger folks, it's around 10 or 11%. Much higher than 7%, much smaller than most of the time. Uh, and so I think if you think about why that is, there's a couple reasons. One, there's a written record of what people share online, so we can see it. There's not a written record of what we talk about face to face, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. People spend, by some estimates, three hours a day online. It's a, a higher number than it's been in the past. There are still many more hours that were offline. Uh, and if you think about it, you know, there's a lot of hype around these technologies, because no one's going to write a front page newspaper article on the cover of the Wall Street Journal saying, hey, you know what people do? They talk face to face, like they have for thousands of years. Right? The, the impetus on the news side is to talk about the new thing, the different thing, even if that thing is really small. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of hype around social media. There are a lot of people that are social media gurus that have built careers around sort of these tools. And I don't mean to suggest that these tools are not important, but they're not the only way that word of mouth is shared, and they're not even the way that most word of mouth is shared. And so what I would ask each of you is, you know, if you know for the work that you do, most people are sharing your stuff, the way you get new clients, the way messages are shared is via social media, great. But if you're sitting there going, well, most people talk face to face, use the channel that works for the audience that, that you work with. Over here. So one of the uh, uh, aspects of th that's very specific to AIA as a national organization and grassroots as a meeting of the leadership of this organization is really what is the appropriate uh, Venn diagram of what AIA as this national organization, this group of leaders, how does that overlap with this much larger global picture of what the, what the message is about architecture can be. So, you know, w there's, a, there's a lot of conversation about, uh, and, and actually the I Look Up campaign is a great example of, you know, just really making people aware of architecture in the most, most general way versus kind of what can AIA do to help 80,000 practitioners in, in literally tens of thousands of different businesses you know, ultimately succeed in their business framework in order to be able to be doing architecture, to be affecting that, that, you know, that I look up uh, new us. world. You know, so, so a lot of this really ultimately then does come down to what we, we can do as an organization. Are we intersecting with the influencers? You know, should we be going to golf tournaments uh, where the people with the big checks are, you know, there with their checkbooks? Uh, 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 how do we affect, uh, you know, the, with the things that you've shown today, these examples where it's much more about public perception. Where's the right place for us to be aiming? Jump me to well, hand, yeah. Thanks, Carl. Um, you know, there's a lot of, lot of things there, but having read the book, um, I think I already has attributed the steps uh, plan to some components. And I would say that, you know, we have, a, uh, Joan has provided a great lens for us to look at to sort of build our own Trojan horse uh, for these kernels of messages that are inside every communication that, that we get out. I know you're in, interested in sustainability. To me, the Ed Masria 2030 initiative, how many billions of dollars have not been spent on utilities because of better design in the last 15 years? That has social currency. Billions of dollars tends to get people's attentions. The H&R Block ad, you know, yeah. I want my billions back is kind of working. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that steps 
is the tool that we should be really looking through everything, the social currency, the triggers, the emotion, and mostly the stories. But yeah, no, I, I would very much agree. And I think uh, a good way to think about it is what's great about an association like this is it brings everybody together. It provides a coordinating mechanism. Each of you has an individual community that you want to activate, right? But this provides a little bit of coordination saying across communities, how can we standardize some of our messaging? How can we standardize some of the learnings? How can we bring some group of people to be effective to all be on the same page to help work together towards, towards a common goal? But it's a little bit like sort of the air support and the ground troops. We need both to, to be successful. I just want to say one thing, I think we're at time otherwise. Yeah. But the last thing I would say is, you know, I know that this may not be a usual way for thinking for some of you in the room. For some of you, I hope you liked it, but for some of you I know it may not be a usual toolkit. It's really easy to see something like this and say, we could never do this. We could never come up with a panda cheese, we could never come up with a peanut butter. But you can. Maybe a little hard, it's not going to be easy, you're not going to spend 10 minutes on it and get there. But I think I've worked with a lot of companies and organizations to apply these ideas. These are useful tools. You guys do great work, you have a powerful message. And now you have to understand how to be messengers and how to get that message out there. And as you nicely said, I think this is a great toolkit. Think of how to apply the tools, and I, I hope uh, you have a great journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thanks. Superman. The American Institute of Architects, designing a better world.